Father, for bringing us this far and blessing us, Father God, to walk in faith. 
Lord, we realize that we've only come this far by faith. We thank you for another celebration, Father God, of your goodness and your mercy. God, we thank you for wrapping your arms around us and keeping us, Father, bringing us to the house of worship. We thank you, Father God, for bringing us and blessing our lives. We ask you, Father God, to forgive us for our sins. Bless us, Father God, that we will be about your business. And bless us, Father God, as we study your word, that your word will become real to us, that your word will be relevant, that your word, Father God, will sustain us. We ask you to bless us tonight as your word speaks to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. We have come this far. Yes, we have. come this far only by the faith that we have in God. And God is the one who has brought, up, brought us and blessed us. Amen. Not only has he brought us, he's also bought us. Jesus Christ bought us with his precious blood. Amen. Amen. Thank God for another Lord's day that we have come to celebrate who God is and what God is already done. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Tonight we are continuing in chapter 1. Chapter 1 is prepare. Chapter 1 is prepare. Tonight we will deal with the evangelistic essentials. The evangelistic essentials. There are five P's to evangelism. How many P's? What are those five P's? Prepare. Are those questions? <laughs> are those answers? There are five P's to effective evangelism. There are five P's. They are prepare, pinpoint, personalize, picturize, and prescribe. There are five P's. These are five P's to effective evangelism. And these five P's there is one that stands out out of these five P's. There, there is one who stand, that stands out above all others, and that is prepare. The most important of the five P's is prepare. So tonight we spend our third night on the chapter one that deals with prepare. Amen? If you're following along and you're sharing the gospel book, it is page number nine. We have the evangelistic essentials. The evangelistic essentials, right? Right? With the evangel I'm sure you have read it. I'm sure you have talked about it. I am sure you have studied it and you are ready for it tonight. Amen? You are ready for it tonight. Prepare. In any soul winning experience, we must spend 90% of our time in preparation and 10% of our time in actually presenting the gospel. So 90% of our time is spent in preparation. And then we have the other 10% of our time spent in actually the presentation of the gospel or the sharing of the gospel. The sharing of the gospel. Yes, the sharing of the gospel is very important. It is the gospel that draws men to God. It is the gospel that sets our hearts on fire. It is the gospel that, that saves us. But if you are going to be evangelistically correct, evangelistically uh, accurate, if you're going to be evangelistically stable, you must spend some quality time in preparation. 
You have to prepare. And when you prepare, you are spending time in studying the word. You're spending time in praying the word. You're spending time in praying over the word. And you're spending time in meditating on the word. You're spending time in prayer. You're spending time in praying the word. You're spending time in praying over the word. You're spending time in meditating on the word. And then you can talk about sharing the gospel. You can talk about it. Somebody tell me the difference between praying the word and praying over the word. Praying the word and praying over the word. Anybody. Not everybody at one time. Just anybody. Out of the whole house full of people. Just, just anybody. Anybody. What is the difference in praying the word and praying over the word? When you pray in the word, say again. You're reminding God what he said. You, you're saying to God what God has said to you in his word. Right. right? When you pray in the word, you are saying, God, your word says that if I love you, I will keep your commandments. God, your word says that if I keep your commandments, I will be blessed. God, your word says that all things work together for the good to them that love the Lord and to them that are called according to his purpose. God, your word says. So therefore, I'm praying to God what God has said to me. Isn't that something? We're telling God what God has already said to us. So that's praying God's word. So what is praying over God's word? Praying over God's word. Praying over God's word. You pick up your Bible or you hear it to pick up your Bible on your way to the Bible or once you open your Bible, you're saying, God, I am opening your word. God, I am asking you to speak to me by way of your word. God, I need to hear from you. Present yourself to me by your word and through your word. So now I am praying over God's word. God, I am reading now your word. I'm asking you to tell me what your word is saying to us. Now I'm praying over God's word. Once I close my Bible and I'm going on down the street and I'm, I'm meditating on what I've just studied. Now I'm saying, God, speak to me by way of your word, what I've just studied. So I'm praying God's word by telling God what God has said. And then I am praying over God's word by asking God to manifest himself through his word as I read your word, as I study your word, as I present your word. Lord, speak to me through your word. It has been said that a preacher preached for 35 years and after 35 years of preaching, he got saved. He preached for 35 years. And after 35 years of preaching, then one sermon, he got saved. He was speaking God's word, but God, God's word had not convicted him. He had not accepted it. it. It had not penetrated his heart. So we are asking God, God, penetrate my heart by way of your word. So I'm praying over God's word. That's a good test question, man. The difference between praying God's word and praying over God's word. There's a difference. And as we prepare tonight, there are three essentials to evangelism. The first one, and you can fill in your blank on your paper, the first one is love. There are three essentials to evangelism. That means if you're going to evangelize, you have to keep these three things in mind. You have to demonstrate these three things. Number one is love. Number two is hope. Number two is hope. And number three is God's 
word. Whose words? God's words. Number three is God's word. There are three central things. They are love, hope, and God's word. If you're going to be effective in evangelism, if you're going to be prepared in evangelism, you must first know that love is on the scene. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you have to give people hope. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, you have to make sure you give them and present to them and demonstrate to them God's word. These are evangelistic essentials. These three components are essential to evangelism. What are they? Love, love, love hope, love. and God's word. These are essentials. Remember, as a winner of souls, as a soul winner, one must be governed by certain Christian standards of conduct. You must be governed by certain Christian standards of conduct during any soul winning encounter. Just as we have a government of the United States, we have a government of the state of Texas, we have a government in the city of Houston, we have a government that surrounds us in the county. We must be governed by the rules and the regulation that we live in and live under. So as a Christian, you must be governed by Christian standards. You must be governed by Christian conduct. And the essentials in this government of Christianity are love, hope, and God's word. These are crucial instruments. These are crucial elements. These are crucial essentials of any soul winning presentation. They are crucial. These things are crucial. These three factors must be included in any soul winning experience. Mm -hmm. Let's look at them. Let's first of all, uh, Sister Woods, will you get um, John 3.16 for us? Sister Davis, will you get Numbers 21, 7 through 9? Numbers 21, 7 through 9. And when we see these and when we read these two verses, these two passages, or these two pericopes, or these verses, when we read them, then we need to draw a correlation between one and the other. That's Numbers 21, 7 through 9, and John 3, 16. Remember, the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself mighty through us. God is looking to brag on us because we are showing other people that God is mighty. But he wants to show that, show the world that he's mighty by way of us, through us. Numbers 21, verses 7 through 9. Numbers 21, verses 7 through 9. Real big for us, please. Numbers 21, verses 7 through 9. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Verse 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent if a serpent had bitten anyone, then when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Look at the scenario here. The people of God are in the wilderness. They have left Egypt. And in the process of leaving Egypt, they began to sin. Look at what he said. He said in verse number 7, Moses, we've sinned. First thing we've done, we have spoken against the Lord. We have spoken against God. We have sinned. 
So he says here that when you speak against God, what is that? Blasphemy. Yeah. That's sin, right? So if it's sin to speak against God, then God let the snakes out on Wow. They, they went to Moses and said, Moses, these snakes are biting us. We have sinned. So they've sinned against God. For we have spoken against God. Look at the second part of that. We have sinned. For we have spoken against God. And Moses, we've spoken against you. Wow. So he says, Moses, help us. Moses, we've sinned against God. And because we have sinned, and the way we have sinned is, first of all, we spoke against God. Second way we've sinned is we've spoken against the man of God. Isn't that something? We have spoken against God. We've spoken against the men of God. And now these serpents are messing with us. These serpents are biting us. Please take away these serpents. We've spoken against God. We've spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord, Moses. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. Take away the serpents from us. We've sinned and we've done it. They've sinned several ways, but this particular pericope points out two things. We've spoken against God and we've spoken against you, Moses. Now, Moses, since we've spoken against you and you have connection with God, what we want you to do is speak to God on our behalf. Pray to the Lord that he takes away, or he take away in the New King James, that he take away the serpents from us. And just like a good man of God ought to, the verse says, so Moses prayed for the people. It didn't say Moses held grudges against them. It says Moses prayed for the people. Isn't that something? First of all, Moses was upset because they prayed, they, they spoke against God. When they should have been praying, they were speaking against God. Secondly, they spoke against Moses, who was their leader. And then they come to the leader and say, leader, what we need you to do is pray to the same God we spoke against. And even though we spoke against you, we want you to pray to God. Question or comments? And guess what Moses did? So Moses prayed for the people. He could have said, y'all pray for yourself. All the trouble y'all giving me, pray for yourself. But the Bible says, so Moses prayed for the people. So Moses prayed for the people. Verse number 8, Numbers 21, verse number 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, take a fiery serpent. Take a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. In other words, take a fiery serpent and put it on a pole on a, in an elevated place. Take a fiery serpent, make a, a fire, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bidden, when he looks at it, shall live. Where do we see this fiery serpent in the 21st century? We get away to tell you that one. Where do we see this fiery serpent? You see on the Amalek system medical. And a lot of people get that confused with it being satanic. Yes. It, 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 it is scripture. This is where it comes from. Yes. So when you go to a doctor's office, 
When you look at the doctor's degrees and the doctor's certification, when you see it on the ambulance, when you see it in the hospital, this is where it comes from. And you see the serpent shaped the same way and going in the same direction every time you look at it. The serpent is on a pole. What's the people problem? They need to be healed. Yes? You get bit by a snake. Do you need to be healed? So what, what, what God does, he takes the same issue that gave them an issue, the same creature that gave them an issue, and he blesses them through it. They're in pain. They are dying. God says, Moses, make a serpent. A fiery serpent. Take a serpent. And when you take this serpent, you make sure you put this serpent on a pole. Set it on a pole. After they beg Moses to pray for him. After they spoke against Moses, they begged him to pray for him. Take a serpent, put it on a pole, and when you put it on a pole, Moses, this is what's going to happen. Everybody who's bitten by the snake, when they look up at the snake, they will be healed. When you bit by a snake, you need a healing. When you look up at the snake, you shall be healed and you will live. Verse number 8. Numbers 21 and 8. So guess what Moses did? So Moses made a bronze serpent and did what with it? Put it on a pole. The leader did just what God told him to do. He took a bronze serpent, he put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Now, what does that got to do with John 3.16? Uh-uh. I guarantee you it got something to do with John 3.16. Who's reading John 3.16? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. What is that? What did you just read? John 3.16. John 3.16. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you back up a little bit? I read 15. Read verse 14, 15, and 16 all together first. John uh, 3, 14. Yes. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Mm. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And let me show you what Numbers 21, thank you. Numbers 21, verses 7 through 9, has to do with John 3, 14 through 16. Does anybody see it? Remember, we began this lesson by talking about Jesus is the great physician. He is the doctor. We will never be the doctor right here and prepare. We are only an intern learning about the doctor. And the intern direct the people, directs the patient, direct the sick to the doctor. The intern tells the people, tells the patient what the doctor can do, who the doctor is, what the doctor is capable of doing, what the doctor will do, what the doctor can do, and they point him to the doctor. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. So here we have these people being bitten in the wilderness. They're being bitten by a snake, by several snakes. 
they're going to die. God, even when we sin, he creates an avenue for us to get back to him. Yeah, he's an awesome God. People always ask the question, will God, a loving God, be so mean that he'd send folk to hell? Say again? Would God be so mean that he would send people to hell? The Bible teaches that this gospel will be presented to everybody and everybody will be given a chance. In their very own way. The reason why we ought to baptize children is because they know Jesus in their very own way. Once they confess the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we don't expect them to know him as we know him. We ought to baptize them because they know him on their level in their own way. We can't wait till they become adults. Because they know Jesus on their own level. And this baptism process is a, a lowering down all the way under the water. So when you look at salvation, the people had salvation to live in the wilderness simply because they were willing to look up at a bronze snake. The same type of snakes. That were biting them. They looked up at the snake and they were healed. Isn't that something? So he says, he says in John chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, the same way that men looked up at the snake in the wilderness and they were saved. Whenever Jesus is looked up. When Jesus is lifted up and man looks up at Jesus, they will be saved. Woo, that, that's good to me. That, that's good to me. I, I want to shout on a, a wind tonight. The, the text declares Numbers 21 and John chapter 3 discusses with us that God had a plan in the wilderness to save mankind. Their physical death was shut down in the wilderness. By them looking up at a snake. Now remember. It was snakes that were biting them. And then God says. Look up at a snake. And if they look up. God will heal them. When you fast forward. Over to the New Testament. It is man that got out of place with God. And God uses a man. Jesus Christ. To put us back in right standing with God. My, my, my. Who would not serve a God like this? We must be prepared. God so loved the world. So, when, when, when you see the text and it says, so, it's not a measurement of how much God loves us. I know it's been taught that way, it's been preached that way, but when he uses the word so, it's not, it's not a measure of so God so loved the world so much, he loved the world, the world in such a big way. That's not what he's talking about. He said, as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, and men lives were spared, so it will be when men look to Jesus on Calvary. Their spiritual lives will be saved. That's why we read the whole content. That's why we read whole pericopes. That's why we read whole thoughts. Because all these years we've been taught. God so loved the world so much until his love is so low you can't get up. His love is so high you can't get over it. His love is so wide we can't get around. And people shout it to that stuff. But what he's saying is so as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness so as God has loved us so much so that if we look to Jesus 
God gave his only begotten son. And if we just look to Jesus as they looked at the snake in the wilderness, we will be saved. Question or comments? God loves us. He loves us and God wants everybody to be born again. And God wants to use us to make it happen. We will never be the doctor, so we can't cure anybody. We can't cure men of their sin. The doctor has already arrived. The doctor has already died. The doctor, his name is Jesus. There's a doctor in the house. His name is Jesus. And there are three essentials in evangelistic experiences. One is, two is, three is, God's word. Remember, we have Christian standards of conduct. These are crucial elements of every soul-winning experience. When we look at love, we must exemplify love, the love of Christ. We must exemplify the love of Christ in all that we say and in all that we do. We must exemplify Jesus Christ in all we say and all we do. Jesus must be the main attraction in the center of attention. In our soul winning experience, Jesus must be. Who must be? Jesus must be the main attraction in the center of attention. Jesus must be that. God's love fills your life. God's love fills your life and gives you the ability to reach out to others. God's love Fills our lives, fills your life, and gives you the ability to look out to others. When we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, now about is three. The greater of these three is love. Let's turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. When you get there, let me know and someone read for me. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. And now abide faith, hope, love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. The greatest is love. Greatest. God loves us so much. Just as Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness, so has Jesus been raised up on Calvary. God loves us. And we ought to exemplify God's love to other people. The second one is hope. Undergird yourself with faith and hope. Undergird yourself with faith and hope. If you are witnessing, if you're telling someone about Jesus, you got to have faith and you have to have hope because your instruction is to give other folk hope. You know, the worst thing you can do is sound pitiful when somebody's going through something. When somebody's going through something and they tell you about it, they are searching for hope. They're depending on your faith. When someone is going through something, they want you to offer them hope. They want you to give them some confidence. They want you to give them something that they can see that they're not seeing right now. Something that they can feel that they're not feeling right now. They need hope. 
the tragedy with many Christians are that they get down in the gutter with them. Oh, baby, I feel so bad for you. It's, we ought to cry together. But after you get through crying, you need to give them hope. Undergird yourself. Make sure you build yourself up with faith and hope. Build yourself up with faith and hope. Commission the, the ministering spirits to go forth, providing hope to others. Commission the ministering spirits to go forth, providing hope to others. What do you mean? God, I need you to bless me. I need your spirit to guide me. I need your angels to be with me. My brother said that when he, when he showed up at the church, he showed up and before he got in his car at home, he said, Lord, give your ministering angels charge over the vehicle. Then when he got in the car, he said, God, give your ministering angels direction and, and bless them to go with me. And when he shut his car door, he said, now the rest of y'all stay around here and protect my vehicle. So we ought to commission the ministering spirit, the ministering angel, to go forth, providing us with hope so we can provide others with hope. Things happen to us, right? Even Christians, even Christians have issues that deserve tissues. We have problems, right? How many people got one problem tonight? Just, just one. Just, just one. If you can deal with if you can deal with one, it's probably a whole big problem that you've been dealing with. Because if you could have gotten rid of it, guess what you would have done? Gotten rid of it. So, so we need to make sure that we offer people hope. Somebody comes to you and say, Oh, I had death in my family. I lost my job. My spouse walked out on me. My, my children don't like me. And then my school kicked me out. What you gonna say? Oh, you still are doing pitiful. God bless your heart. No, your your spirit and the Holy Spirit ought to kick in and offer that person some hope. If they say, "Well, this went wrong," and you say, "But Jesus can fix it." Well, well, this is not happening fast enough, but Jesus can fix it. Don't make them promises, but give up hope. Don't be like the false prophets. In the morning, you're going to have 5,000 more dollars than you had. Stop lying to people. You will be healed by the time you walk out this door. If I am healed, it's because Jesus did it. It has nothing to do with me. God uses man as a conduit, as an instrument to do things that he, he wants to get done. That's why the Bible says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Why does it say that? Because the next part of that verse says that he will commission men to give to you. That, that, that tears a hole in the pie in the sky. It tears a hole in the prosperity preaching. He says, you do something, God will do something. You give and God will commission other folk to give to you. And let me just say this. If somebody gives to you, don't you just turn around and give to them because they gave to you. God is blessing you through other folk so you can be a blessing to other people. He will give you good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. Will he cause men to give into your bosom? You got to give them hope. See, you got to give them hope. You, you, 
they people need hope. I'm going to tell you, in the 21st century, more than in the 20th century, men, women, boys, and girls need some hope. People are giving up because they have no hope. People are quitting on life because they have no hope. We need to offer people hope. God has called us to give people hope. Their hope will grow as they realize that they can be delivered from their past by Christ's death and resurrection. They will have hope and that hope will grow, but you got to give them some hope. You can't be as depressed as they are all the time. There's some depressed people out here, but you got to give them hope. You have to give them hope. The third one is God's word. God's word. Remember, we are praying God's word, and we're praying over God's word. We are praying God's word, and we're praying over God's word. So the, the, the third one is God's word. Feast on God's word. What do I mean when I say feast on God's word? Meditate on it. Meditate on it. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Eat it. Anybody else? Live by it. Live by it. So you're going to feast on God's word. You're going to make sure that God's word is deep down in your heart, in your spirit. And you and and you going to give folk hope because you got God's word. See, if you don't have God's word, you can forget about love. You can forget about hope. So the second two blanks, the, the two first two blanks, uh, feast on God's word by studying the Holy Scriptures daily. Remember, remember, we're just being prepared. We're being prepared. We spend ninety percent of our time in preparation. 10% of our time we spend in actually sharing the gospel. Spend our time by studying the Holy Scriptures daily. The Word of God. Point to Christ. Point men, women, boys, and girls to Christ. That blank there on your paper is Christ. Point to Christ. Point to who? Jesus Christ. Point to Christ. And not to who? Not to yourself. Point to Christ. John says, I am not worthy to even open, to even to tie up his shoes. I'm not even worthy to, to lash up his shoes. No, I'm not the one. There's one who's coming that's greater than I. He is the Christ. This word Christ means the Messiah. This word Christ means the anointed one. Point to Christ and not to yourself. Equip yourself to support the salvation story through the word of God. Equip yourself. How are you going to equip yourself? Study the word. Equip yourself to support the salvation story through the word of God by committing the key scriptures, the key passages of scripture to your memory. Do you know more about as the world stands than you know about the Bible? Is that right? As the world... As, oh, I knew, I knew somebody knew. As the world turned... All of my kids, is that right? All my children. Mm. Another earth? Another world? Do you know more about the bachelor and bachelorette and where all three of them came? From where they came? Did you know about the word of God? Do you know who's going to be on the next 
episode of Dancing with the Stars more than you know about the Word of God? The Word of God ought to be supreme in your life. Put scripture to memory. Remember the old cow back home? The old cow back home had an outer stomach and an inner stomach and an outer belly. You do know that, right? That cow can take something and chew on it all day long for 24 hours. He chews on it. You come back after noon, he still chew on it. What he does is he takes that cook, country folk know what a cook is, he takes that cook, he chews on it, he drops it into his inner stomach, he brings it back up, and he chews on it some more, and he drops it into his outer belly, he brings it back up, and he chews on it some more. That's how we have to meditate on the word of God. We got to chew on it. God said to Ezekiel, eat the whole roll. Chew on it. Meditate on it. Think over it. Pray over it. Think about it. Don't just hurry up and read a scripture just so you can check the box that you read the scripture. <laughs> Don't just listen to the word. Doing our Bible listening process. Guess what? I got behind. Guess why I got behind? Because, oh, this is interesting. Let me go back and hear that again the next day. So we have to meditate on God's word. Meditate on it. Final statement, statement on your paper. It is your privilege and responsibility to read. It is your privilege and responsibility to read, study, it is your privilege and your responsibility to read, study, understand. It is your privilege and responsibility to read, study, understand. It is your privilege and responsibility to read, study, understand, and rightly divide God's word. When telling it to others. It is your privilege. Why is it a privilege? It's a privilege to work for the Lord. It is a privilege to work for the Lord. It is a privilege to witness for the Lord. It is a privilege. It's a privilege that we don't even deserve. That the almighty, awesome God himself has selected us to be about his business. Jesus says, I have to be about my father's business. It is a privilege. It is our responsibility to read, to study, to understand, and rightly divide God's word when telling it to others. It is a privilege. Do you think it's a privilege? Do you think it's our responsibility? It is a privilege for us to do anything for the Lord. That's why I don't understand people. You know, now in the 21st century, we pay people for everything they do. If anybody do anything, if people pick up paper as they pass it by, we want to offer them some money. When I was a boy, we mowed that whole two-acre plant at, at, at St. James, and the, and the eight and a half at Markham Baptist Church and they didn't give us anything until they felt pitiful for us. They had pity on us. And we didn't even expect anything. Now if you get a person to sing a song, they want $125, $150. If you get somebody to mock the flow, they, they got that. we've already taught children how to hold their hands out. But when you're working for the Lord, it may not pay much, but the benefits are out of this world. That's why, that's why the man that was running crazy in the graveyard, Mark says in Mark chapter 5, that when the 
when he met Jesus, he ran to Jesus, bowed down and worshiped him. And, and he, the people came out the next day, this naked man that was running crazy in the graveyard. They said they found him clothed and in his right mind. And now when we thank God in the morning, we say, Lord, thank you that I'm clothed in my right mind. So what God does is he clothed us and then he clothed us in our right mind. Nobody can do it but God. So when we look at First Corinthians, when we look at First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 15, we know that death, burial, and resurrection is there. Now, as of tonight, we know by Jesus says, so God so loved the world. So, why is he saying so? One last question for you, right? Why is he saying so? So as Moses have lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so God loved the world that he gave his son that if we look to Jesus, in the midst of our sin. The people in the wilderness said, God, Moses, we have sinned before God. We have sinned before you. And Moses held up a snake. Anybody that was bitten, if they looked at the snake, they were healed. So, God so loved the world. So, just like Moses held up the snake, Jesus being lifted on Calvary. And anybody look to Jesus shall be healed. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. And if you just look to Jesus, you shall and you will be healed. If you just look to Jesus, your soul will be made over again. If you just look to Jesus, the Lamb of God that God has raised up on Calvary, you shall be saved. And if you never trusted Jesus as your Savior, this is an opportunity to get to know Him. The door of the church is open. This is your invitation. If you would bow your head with me and just invite Him in, Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe if you pray this prayer honestly, believing that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for your sins, now you're on your way to heaven. So, God loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Everlasting, everlasting life. Amen. So today we're going to come and, and read our prayer list for us. We want to lift these in prayer before we leave. That um, God will do the healing. Amen. That God will heal. Uh, for prayer. We are praying for Javon Montes. We're praying for Brittany Walls, Gloria Locks, the Marin family. We're praying for the Galvan Rivas family, the Kathy family. We're praying for the Carter Clark family, the Bradford family, and for Joe and Marlene Studebond. We're praying for them for healing and also um, bereavement. Amen. Thank you. So let's go to God. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless you. We thank you for another privilege to come 
and lift these before you. We pray, Father God, for comfort during these moments of bereavement. We pray that you bless and heal and strengthen. God, we ask you to offer them hope. Give them love for one another. And bless them to saturate themselves in God's word. Bless us tonight, Father God, as we leave this place. That we will keep these on our minds and that we will continue to bless you for them and pray for them. Lord, I ask you, Father God, to heal and touch. Lord, you, we ask you to heal physically and spiritually because we know you can and we know you will. Now, Lord, we come as we end this night's service. We come to give you the glory. And we come to give you a financial blessing. Bless us as we come to give. Bless every giver and bless every gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. If you want to give to the New Beginning Church, you can do so by mailing your gift to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Or you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com lifting.jesus at yahoo.com Let us stand to be dismissed. Father God, we thank you now for these offerings. We thank you for these gifts. We ask you to bless them in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you, Lord, that you're the great I am. You're the God who keeps us and heals us. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus the Christ who keeps us in our right mind, keeps us spiritually, keeps us physically. Now, Lord, we pray for those who have given. We ask you to bless them. We pray for those who will give. We pray, Father God, that you continue to bless our church. And bless us to be about your business and winning souls for Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. I'm looking forward to seeing you on Saturday morning at 9.30. Saturday morning at 9.30, we will go out again to Blanket the Neighborhood. We'll be going out to Blanket the Neighborhood with flyers and meeting our neighbors in the neighborhood. And then secondly, we're looking forward to seeing every man and every boy, every man and every boy Saturday afternoon at 5 p.m., We'll be rearranging some things for our anniversary. Every man and every boy at 5 p.m., 5 p.m. on Saturday afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Be blessed and have a great years, 30 years on Sunday. We are celebrating 30 years on, thir on Sunday. We are celebrating 30 years of being in ministry here at the New Beginning Church. So we are preparing for it, and we're looking forward to you coming out uh, Sunday morning at 10.30 and also 3 p.m. Sunday afternoon. Bless you.